globally synchronized deflationary recession. Now, right now, it's the globally synchronized part that we can see more and more. And as we do, the deflationary recession will become more and more evident, such that even central bankers who right now are fixated on consumer prices and consumer price numbers, they'll even see it too. We talked about China yesterday, China's horrible economic numbers, so horrible that even the staunch communists in Beijing are beginning to panic over them. That's a symptom of globally synchronized deflationary recession. Germany, the German government in January said there'll be no recession and then over the next couple months reported how Germany was already in a recession, a shallow recession, just like Europe overall is. Both Germany and Europe reporting two negative quarters in a row, which some people take as the technical definition of recession. We're not doing that here. We're saying that's the prelude to a much deeper recession coming. So Europe, Germany, they're already in the globally synchronized recession territory as it is. We get a new one, a new one just today, New Zealand. New Zealand, just like Europe and Germany, Suddenly, they're in a technical recession, but not a technical recession. New Zealand is has two quarters straight of G negative GDP, and it's looking to get worse. They just reported today revised numbers on the fourth quarter. They revised those down to minus seven, minus seven tenths of a percent quarter over quarter in the fourth quarter, and then minus 0.1% quarter over quarter in the first quarter. So there's two quarters in a row, but again, it's not about technical recession. It's about New Zealand's economy, like all those others that are already weak, heading into more trouble after the first quarter of 2023. Uh, Jared Kirk, chief economist at Kiwi Bank in Auckland, I think put it best when he said, the brunt of the slowdown is yet to come. We're forecasting further contractions over the year ahead. That's for New Zealand but it could apply just as well to anywhere else. Even Bloomberg's economist, normally, normally the more optimistic take, as far as New Zealand, he said, we think the economy will meaningfully undershoot the Reserve Bank's projections, damping inflation. This will probably lead the central bank to reverse course and cut rates later this year. Again, talking about New Zealand, but in truth, it's anywhere around. The, the economy globally is weak and it's becoming globally synchronized, heading toward deflationary recession. Australia, right, right next door, or practically next door to New Zealand. Australia enters that chat too, enters the view here as well, because the Australian yield curve, which up to now had, had been flattening, it now, the, the Australian government bond curve suddenly joins with the rest around the world as inverted for the first time since 2008. Now, Australia's economy has slowed down, not nearly as much as some of these others around the world, but now the Australian yield curve being inverted tells us that even Australia is starting to sync up with everybody else. Remember, the Reserve Bank of Australia just recently, they had raised rates earlier, then in, after the events in March, they paused for two months, and now they're raising rates again. And the reason they're raising rates like other central banks around the world is, yes, they see the economic weakness, but they also see consumer prices and think that consumer prices are being generated by a couple things. Number one, expectations. And number two, a tight labor market. Remember what the Reserve Bank of Australia said uh, when it raised rates again earlier this month. Growth in the Australian economy has slowed and conditions in the labor market have eased, although they remain very tight. The unemployment rate increased slightly to 3.7% in April, and unemployment growth has moderated. Firms report that labor shortages have eased, although job vacancies and advertisements are still at very high levels. Wage growth has picked up in response to the tight labor market and high inflation. And for central bankers like those in Australia, Europe, the United States, or anywhere else, because they're all trained Keynesians, wages and labor markets are inflation. Forget economic weakness. But we can't forget economic weakness. Plus, we have to pay attention to the fact, or what we reasonably believe is a fact, labor markets around the world are being overstated. And I mentioned this a couple days ago. It's something called labor hoarding. And that's something we really need to talk about as the globally synchronized recession begins to more and more, not just synchronize, but reveal itself. Because if we are indeed experiencing labor hoarding, not only will that mean central bankers are wrong about inflation, 
or as well as wrong, being wrong about the labor market, the consequences of de-hoarding get to be pretty severe. But first, I'm Jeff. This is Eurodollar University. Thank you very much for joining me. If you are interested, Eurodollar University has memberships available where we talk about money and macro, but mostly money, the Eurodollar system, what it is, how it's supposed to work, why it isn't working, where the circulation has gone, and what is blocking monetary circulation, causing monetary deflation. We also have research subscriptions. I contribute a daily briefing over at marketsinsiderpro.com. You can check that out there. I also do a daily deep dive where we dive deep into all of these things, money as well as macro, understanding what's going on today so that we can be hopefully prepared enough for what's coming tomorrow. All the information about research subscriptions as well as memberships, eurodollar.university. Labor hoarding as a concept is really easy to understand, although I think it is, it is misunderstood in how prevalent it actually can be and maybe how prevalent it is right now. We'll get into some statistics about that in just a second. But labor hoarding, I, we talked about uh, the chief economist for the conference board a couple days ago, and I, I'll bring back that quote because I think it, it uh, explains what's going on really well here. Uh, Dana Peterson, conference board chief economist, said... CEOs have been saying for at least a year that they expect that there will be a recession in the U.S., but it's going to be shallow and it's going to be short. So if you think that the recession is not going to be too bad and it's not going to be too long and you spent a lot of money trying to attract and retain labor, you're less likely to let those people go. So you take the hit to your bottom line, revenues go down a little bit, business gets soft, you don't fire as many workers, even though you have workers that are just sitting around doing nothing, you hold on to them because the recession's not gonna be very deep and it's not gonna be very long and there'll be recovery on the other side. We might as well just hang on to our workers today to get us through, we'll, we'll get through the recession, we'll get through the downturn and then we'll be right back to business in you, as usual. In fact, they're making a calculation that it's more expensive to lay off workers today and hire them back in a few months than it is to take the hit to their bottom lines by keeping their workers employed. And this is, this is a, first of all, it's a common occurrence in periods leading up to recession. But again, I think it's even more prevalent in 2022 and 2023 in particular than it has been in past cyclical episodes. A firm called Skynova uh, conducted a survey way back in uh, toward the end of last year into early part of this year, releasing the results in February. They surveyed 1,010 small businesses. And here's what they found. Most small businesses seemed interested in keeping the status quo within their company. An astounding 91% of small business owners said they're labor hoarding. And you can expect this trend to continue. 89% were planning to keep it up in 2023. Large business owners were even more likely to do it as 99% said they were labor hoarding to, to some capacity. And if small business owners are doing that to this degree, we can reasonably presume that larger and me medium-sized and larger businesses are also doing it to a significant, significant degree as the economist from the conference board stated in, his, in the interview last week. And the reason they're doing it, uh, Skynova uncovered, um, owners are self-reporting an average, according to their own calculations, of $4,541 in savings by retaining workers rather than firing them and trying to hire them back. Because then they'll have to, you know, have to spend uh, training costs, getting employees up to speed, inefficiencies in training workers with whatever it is you have them doing, all of that kind of thing. And because the costs are perceived to be so high, the threshold for undertaking labor hoarding and then de-hoarding is much higher. In fact, it's so high that, again, going back to Skynova's data, to avoid layoffs, 60% of small business owners said they've already instituted a hiring freeze, which is something that we've talked about for some time here. 58% said They've already cut benefits and perks. So whittling away around the edges, cutting costs, uh, uh, trying to get a control over costs as business softens. 48% implemented a four day work week for some of their workers just to keep them employed, understanding they have less and less to do. There's the hours number that we've been talking about over the last several months and which we're gonna get into in just a minute, a couple minutes here too. 
and 67% of small business owners said they are willing to cut their own pay to avoid layoffs. So again, it sounds it doesn't sound unreasonable to think that in this business environment, in this cycle in particular, labor hoarding is even a larger phenomenon than it had been in previous instances. Because we see labor hoarding and we also see cyclical swings that expose the labor hoarding before each and every recession to various degrees. What are those cyclical indicators exposing the downside in the economy? Well, we have surveys and anecdotes like this, but as I've talked about before with the payroll or numbers, hours, hours worked. Unusually, hours worked in the establishment survey, the index for aggregate hours across the entire economy, that has declined since January. So that's a four month period with negative hours, which is highly suggestive of a recessionary period. It's, it's suggestive of what we just talked about, that business owners are indeed cutting back on workers, even if they aren't yet laying them off. They're hoarding workers, but, worker, but working the hoarded workers less than they had before. There are other cyclical indications. A big one is temp workers. Now, do you think that given all the rhetoric about this labor shortage we've been hearing constantly over the last year and a half or so as the unemployment rate gets lower and lower, that temp workers would be, the temp worker number would be off the chart, through the roof. Businesses would be hiring temps hand over fist. And they're not. In fact, the number of temp workers in the U.S. economy peaked way back, of course, in March of 2022. So as we heard shouts about labor shortage, temp work has actually declined and has declined in the same cyclical fashion as we see preceding most recessions. We see a decline in temp workers because even though employers are hoarding their own workers, they have no problem in hiring fewer temps because they don't actually need them. Back in 2007 and 2008, um, just like ours, we saw temp work actually peak in January of 2007. So throughout 2007, the level of temp workers in the U.S. started to decline. It peaked at about um, 2.65 million in January 07, and that got down to around 2.55 million by January 2008. So a modest decline, but no longer growing. And you think, well, that 100,000 decline really isn't all that much. And it's really not. But the point is that companies were already taking steps to manage their costs. And that included hiring fewer temp workers and getting rid of some of those that they had already hired. Again, a cyclical indicator. From January 2008 until August, the rate of temp worker declining that accelerated so that the number of temp workers in the U.S. economy fell to 2.34 million by August 2008 and then went right off the cliff with everything else. But as that was going on, as the cyclical indicators showed that the businesses in the U.S. economy were taking steps to control their costs, they were still hoarding workers. They, as they were hoarding workers, they made it seem as if the labor market was more robust and resilient than it truly was. The labor market picture was better presented by the hours number as well as the temp workers number than it had been in the establishment survey number of payrolls, for example. I've talked about this recently too, and I'll bring this up again. In August of 2008, August of 2008, policymakers were looking at the main labor data, not the stuff that we're talking about, the main labor data and saying, we don't think there's going to be recession because the jobs numbers don't look that bad. This is Jeffrey Lacker again, again, August of 2008. I expect payroll employment to continue to decline for a while at about the current pace, a pace that, as others have noted, is quite modest relative to what we typically see in a recession. I think the most likely outcome is for us to continue to skirt an outright recession. Instead, as the other numbers and lots of other economic data that we talk about often that central bankers don't consider, had showed the economy was actually much weaker than the establishment survey in particular, or the unemployment made it seem at that time. What was going on was essentially what we're seeing today. Businesses were waiting, waiting out what they thought was going to be a short, shallow recession. Because up until that point, 
yes, there, there was lots of recessionary data, but as far as most people's business, it didn't look all that bad. Sort of like past recessions in 73 and 74, the initial stage was relatively shallow. So it's not unreasonable to say, well, I think this is gonna be a short, shallow recession, so I'm gonna hold on to workers, I'm not gonna fire them. And then all of a sudden you realize that was a mistaken impression, a mistaken assumption, and the bottom just falls out. So suddenly you, you find as a business owner that you've been cutting your own pay, you've been cutting back on hours just to keep workers, and now you have this nightmare scenario where you realize the economy is going to get worse and it's going to stay worse for far longer than you thought. So even though you don't want to get rid of your workers, you have to. So the hoarding quickly becomes de-hoarding, which we see in the mass, wave, mass waves of layoffs all across the economy. So in addition to the indications that we have in 2023 of a lot of labor hoarding, hoarding going on, maybe a lot more than we saw in 2007 and 2008, we also have several indications that suggest the switch might be switching, might have been, might have been flipped here to go from labor hoarding, making the labor market seem tighter and more resilient than it actually is, to suddenly de-hoarding. One of those indications, jobless claims. Now, jobless claims continue to be much lower than they have been. I mean, historically speaking, only 262,000, but 262,000 is the highest in a couple of years, and it was 262,000 for the second week in a row last week. So we're looking at jobless claims, and it's only two weeks, wondering if they continue to go up. Does that tell us that the, that the transition from labor hoarding to labor de-hoarding has, has been activated? And if it does, then the globally synchronized deflationary recession, as it's becoming more globally synchronized, becomes more the deflationary recession that even central bankers will have to pay attention to. Because at that point, there'll be no getting away from it. And just remember how we got here. We got here with, there'll not be a recession, everything's fine. In fact, the economy is red hot. And then they said, well, okay, maybe there'll be a shallow recession, but just in one or two places. That won't impact us. Now we're at the stage where we're seeing, okay, there's going to be recessions in more places, but they're going to be shallow and short. You keep moving more and more in the direction of the globally synchronized deflationary recession. And it's only a matter of time before labor hoarding, which we know is going on, weakness in the labor market that we know is going on, all of it combines and collides together for a globally synchronized deflationary recession. Central bankers are looking at consumer prices and thinking tight labor markets when all the rest of the data, as well as common sense and intuition, suggests they're looking at all the wrong things yet again. I'm Jeff. This is Eurodoll University. Thank you very much for joining me. As always, huge thank you, Eurodoll University, Research subscribers, Markets Insider Pro, research subscribers, and our Eurodollar University members, my thank you. And until next time, all of you, take care.